Praise and honor to the Most High Yah by way of Yahusha Hamashiach, John 5 and 39. John 5 and 39 says this. Search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And you will not come to me that you might have life. I receive not honor from men, but I know you, that you have not the love of Elohim in you. He said, how can you believe which receive honor one of another and not the honor that come from Allah only? Because, you know, that's what a lot of people problem is. They worrying about what other people think, what other people say. It dictates their actions and it dictates their ways. Nevertheless, go to Jeremiah 18 and 18. Brother put that on my thing the other day, man. And I took a gander at it. And I guess we're just going to start off and take a gander at it right now. Jeremiah 18 and 18. Matter of fact, before we read verse 18, get a pick at it at, at about verse 11. Jeremiah 18 and 11. I just want you to hear something that this man has to say. I hope y'all can hear me pretty well. Now therefore go to, go to speak to the men of Yehudah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith Yehudah, Behold, I frame evil against you and devise a device against you. Return ye now every one from his evil way and make your ways and your doings good. And they said, There is no hope, but we will walk after our own devices and we will do we will every one do the imagination of his evil heart. Notice that the people said, he told them to repent. They say we ain't got no hope. Now, let's look at it, Hebrews 11 and 1. Why, why would, let's sit back and look. Why would these men feel like there is no hope? We're just going to go ahead and just walk after the imagination of our evil heart. That's a bold statement to say that Yah is telling you repent and I will not slay you. And they say they heard this proclamation of evil against them. And they decided, you know what? It ain't no hope for us. There's no hope for us. We might as well keep going. And I'll give Isaiah 57 and 10. Make it about 57 and 7. Right after that. They say there's no hope for us. Let me get to Hebrews 11 and 11. And why, why this is important? Because then you might can be able to understand why the wicked are the way that they are. Because then you should see, be able to sit back and think about two people who felt like it wasn't no hope for them. So they just went ahead and went their way and did what it is that they felt like they wanted to do. He said, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. So it's the things that you hope for, the things that you can't see. Before we get Isaiah 57, go to Romans chapter 8 real fast. See, the, the evidence of those who are wicked is this right here, right? And I think it's something in 2 Corinthians. I need to pull my book out. For that. For Romans 8, what it is, about 23. See, the wicked don't have no hope because the wicked don't have no faith. 8 and 24. Because to have hope, you got to have patience. And to have patience, you got to trust Yah, which means you got to wait on Yah. And the wicked, that ain't in their heart. The wicked will, a, the, a, a strong sign of someone whom is not chosen is they can't wait. They have no patience. You understand something, right? And I'm, and I'm, I'm going to go into that. It's for as being of the fruit of the Ruach. And the fruit of the Ruach, the Ruach is for the chosen. Because if your name been written in the Lamb's Book of Life from the beginning of the foundation of the world, then you would have a heart to wait on Yah. If you're saying there's no hope, that means you don't have no patience. So they felt like there's no need for me to wait on Yah. I'm going to just do what I want to do anyway. So also from the simple fact what you read in Jeremiah 18, if they already feel like I'm going to do what I want to do anyway, then they're a rebel. Because he said they're going to walk after the evil imagination of their own heart. So if they're walking after the evil imagination of their own heart, that means they can't have a mind after Yah's own heart. 
And if they don't have a mind after Yah's own heart, then that is a serious problem. Romans 8 and 24. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man see, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then we do with patience wait for it. See, that's the difference between someone who's chosen and someone who's not. Because someone who's not is not going to wait. Let's look at an example of someone who didn't want to wait. What I was thinking about was is in 2 Corinthians. Hold on. We still got Isaiah 57 to 10. Let me find this spot in Corinthians I'm thinking about. I think I would be remiss if I just overlooked it and not did it. See, you can't sit back and say you believe in Yah, then you don't wait on him. Because you feel like you want what you want right now and you're going to push it. And you're not going to wait. Look here, man. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 6. That ain't the main thing that I want, but uh, I'll get it in a minute. Because, you know, the things that you can see are temporal and the things that you can't see are eternal. The things that you can't see, you yet wait for. And it's funny that now that once everybody's finding out we're an Israelite and dealing with the book that they feel like faith is a Christian concept and you ought to know and they toss things out the window when faith is not above on you just believing something just to believe it it's the expectation of receiving something though your eyes cannot lay hold upon what it is that you're waiting to receive you know what I'm saying like if you look at an example of that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob have an expectation of receiving a covenant or, or receiving a land which had been coveted unto them, though they could not see it. They had this expectation. David had an expectation of Solomon being king and rule, though he did not see it. This is their expectation. He gave a prophecy that death will be swallowed up in victory. These people' expectation was that would be occur, that would occur, though they could not see it. That means they're putting the trust and hope in the individual who made the promise. Abraham could not see Sarah having a child, yet his expectation was that she would have it because of the person who promised it. See, most brothers and sisters have a, a, a very, very, very gross misrepresentation of what faith is. It's a hope and a promise. These stupid niggas hope as that this man delivers them from their captivity. I'm talking about physical. That they don't even realize you are hope. You can't see that. That's why a lot of niggas say we need to get guns and do this and leave. And it's that then the third because they don't want to wait for it because they have no earnest expectation. They don't sincerely believe that he's going to do what he said he was going to do. They don't believe it. So they will ridicule you. That's why you got to guard your heart. I'm just trying to tell you something to put you up on game so nobody don't throw you off course because niggas out here trying to do it every day. Therefore, are we always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the master. For we walk by faith and not by sight. Now, who can y'all think of that made a move based on what they were promised versus what they could see? Now, I just mentioned one, the big, biggest one that we all know, and that's Abraham. But there are others. Who did y'all promise something that they could not see at the time yet walked as if it was going to happen? Joseph. Joseph indeed. Because he promised this man that he would, y'all know the story in Genesis 37, he would promise a dominion and rule and that his brothers would bow down unto him. He couldn't see that. His parents, his father was like, man, I don't even know what that means. I will consider it. I will consider it. Well, you have to realize that all the promises that are made in the new covenant, you can't see the Ruach HaKadosh. You can't see eternal life. You can't see it. Isaiah 64 and 9. And then we'll look at 57 and 10. You got to remember, that's why he say Baruch is those that endure temptation. For when he has endured, he will receive a crown of life, which you who have promised to all them that love him. 
So you have to believe that there is a crown for you if you can be able to endure all manner of persecution, tribulation, and temptation. Niggas getting clipped every day, B. Niggas getting clipped every day out here on these streets for one reason and one reason alone. Because you want to receive honor from men. You worry about what the next nigga think. You know what I'm saying? Screw it. It's too many times I've had to tell y'all this too. Just like I said in John, they want the praise of men more than the praise of Elohim. What you care what a nigga think for? Nine times out of ten, a nigga you worrying about what he think don't even care about you. In real life, nigga don't even care about you. You know what's crazy I've seen in my lifetime? We put so much care. The people that we, the people that that a lot of people end up who they end up getting burned by. They end up getting burned by the people who they, they were, they, like, like Paul say, they had men's, well, that was Peter, I believe, that was Peter who said that. They had men's persons, they take advantage of men because of men's person because of advantage or admiration, I should say. I misquoted them grossly, but people look at certain men, certain women, they have respect of persons, so whatever this person can say or do or dress or have, they tend to lend more weight to this individual. Nine times out of ten, that person don't want nothing but the admiration that you trying to get that that you trying to give them. They don't really care about you, and they use that to their advantage. You know what I'm saying? And they go about to destroy you. Then the people who we look at as being lesser, who actually tell you wise words and give you wise counsel and show you the way that you ought to go, you don't want to hear them because you don't like how they dress or you don't like how they look. Or most of the time, you don't like that they didn't tell your black behind what you wanted to hear. You know what I'm saying? If people sleeping on their soul out here every single day, in the word, I ain't talking about out the word, playing with it. You know, if you're not going to be fully dedicated to it, that's why I mentioned that thing to y'all about under, the under dude with Under Armour, man. See, I can respect anybody that's a hustler, man. You 23 years old, and you decide to start a company in your mama's basement, and you're willing to do whatever it takes to achieve the success that you after. How can we sit here and say that we are here to save our soul and are not willing to do everything that is required to save it? How would you not be able to consider somebody when they give you why? Because like, like we just read, right? He told him in Jeremiah 18, I've devised a device to destroy you, but if you amend your ways, I don't. So if somebody's telling you something where you're out of pocket, but they give you a way and a means to solve that thing that got you out of pocket, or direct you in a way to get you back in line so you're not out of pocket, then that person actually cares about you and they're there to assist you. Somebody who just says, you be encouraged, brother. Yahuwah loves you. Stay strong. Nigga don't love you, man. Because nigga probably just as sour as you. Or doing something just as sour as you. And they want to make sure that you can be able to give them that same bovine extra mint comfort when they can when they get exposed. Or when they cars get shown. And you can't go for that. I be telling y'all, man, over and over again, man, if you really walking with you, who are you gonna have less friends, less love, more enemies, and more hate? And that's just the way it goes because they're not your enemy and they don't hate you. I told y'all that over and over and over and over again. You need to understand that their problem is not with you. Their problem was with him who created you. Isaiah 64 and 9. My apologies. That's not the proper verse. 64 and 4. My apologies. I apologize, uh. But we'll look at verse 1 though And just flow it like that Oh that thou would rend Shamahim That thou would come down That's right cause we gotta look at some of that stuff And judge it chapter 5 Oh I'm tripping Alright we work it all in It's the Sabbath ain't nothing gonna hurt nothing That the mountains might flow down at thy presence As when the melting fire burned The fires caused the waters to boil to make thy name known to thine adversaries, that the nations may tremble at thy presence, when thou did terrible things which we look not for. For thou came down, the mountains flowed down at thy presence. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard, nor perceived by the ear, neither have the eye seen, O Elohim, besides thee, what he had prepared for him, that wait for him. Now I'm going to ask y'all a question. What do y'all think verses 1 and 3 are telling you about? And who can pinpoint direct locations? You don't got to give me book, chapter, and verse. Just round about whatever. 
What is verses 1 and 3 telling you about? And I need scriptures for this because I've got to start being more stringent on that about y'all just giving these old general answers. Y'all need to know where y'all can uh, reconcile these things out in the word. We don't need generalities. Generalities are for bland people who just trying to get by. You're not trying to get by. You're trying to get in. You're trying to get over. You're trying to overcome. You can't overcome with generalities or just doing the bare minimum that you think is going to get you by. That's why most people fail because they're only trying to do just enough to get by. You're not in high school no more just trying to pass the class with a C. You know what I'm saying? You got to do more than just try to get by. Anybody got into that? When we look at verse 1, what do you get from verse 1 and where can you reconcile verse 1 at? Who has an idea? Nobody. Somebody work with me, please. So I wager no one's gonna. I would think this here was pretty easy. I verse one that looks that that's, that's pretty easy. Clearly it is not. All right then. He said it to Ren Shamahim. So let's look at Haggai chapter 2. Hold Isaiah 64 and Isaiah 57. Let's look at Haggai chapter 2. He said he should rend. He said oh that he would rend it. So nobody wanted to help us out on that one. You got any ideas over there little muffin? He said, Oh, that thou would rend Shamahim, and thou would come down, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence. You got any ideas over there, Lamar? Yeah, I need a little bit more specific than that, sir. What'd you say, little mother? That's the people asking for the mountains to fall on them. But we just read the second part with the mountains on Wednesday. That's why I asked. We just read that on Wednesday. Where did he say in the book where he would return to? The Mount of Olives, didn't it? In Zechariah 14 and 4, what did he say that those mountains would do? That they would move out of the way. That they would move out of the way at his presence and drop down at his presence. See, this is what I mean. I better be a little bit hard on that about being specific. Because the time for just being general is done. Y'all need to be way more specific. It should click in your brain. You should know. Do you know what I'm saying? You got to be able to know. Cause, because I already know that y'all already know from what we deal with that is talking about him. And that's what and I'm using that to illustrate a point of the time for just trying to get the bare minimum or just being general so you can skate on by. That's not gonna cut it. You know what I'm saying? That's not gonna cut it. Because you can't do that in nothing in your life and be successful, especially when you already know generally what it's discussing. So you have to be able to be specific. So when you hear him say, let's rend Shamahim, let me get the Haggai because I asked for it. And then we come right back to Isaiah. So when we look at Haggai chapter 2, right? And we look at about verse 5. He said, According to the word that I coveted with you when you came out of Mishraim, so Barai Ruach remain among you, fear ye not. For thus saith you who of hosts, yet once it is a little while, and I will shake Shamahim and their rats in the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations, and the desire of the nation shall come, and I will fill this house with esteem, saith you who of hosts. Now, he said, Ren Shamahim. 
Does not, does not Revelation 19, does not Matthew chapter 24, does it not say that he will, does not Revelation 5 say that he'll roll back Shamahim like a scroll? The same thing Isaiah 34 says? See, he'll roll it back. So when they say to tear it into pieces or to rip it open and to return, this is your expectation and your hope. How can we look at this? Look at Revelation 14. Because remember, we're looking at Isaiah 8, Jeremiah 18, where he told them to amend their ways and doings. And the people say, we don't have no hope. We're just going to follow after our own way and our own heart. Let's look at Revelation chapter 14. See, that's what a wicked individual who doesn't trust in Yah, who has no expectation for salvation, this is what they're going to say, because they have a love for wickedness. So therefore, they're going to go after wickedness. Verse 9 of Revelation 14. My apologies. Verse 6. Listen to what he says. And I saw another Malachim fly in the midst of Shamahim, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the Arats and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. So the, he bringing the word, so the word, not, not the Malachim itself, but a word is being preached. These people got to hear the word. Saying with a loud voice, fear Elohim and give esteem to him. For the hour of his judgment is come. Worship him that made Shamahim and their rats in the sea and the fountains of waters. And there followed another Malachim saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. The third Malachim followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of Elohim, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of his Kadesh Malachim and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascend up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast in his image, whosoever received the mark of his name. The people who received this, 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 this particular thing, go to Daniel chapter 11. Let's look and see why they received it. And let's see what they put their hope and expectation in. Daniel chapter 11 and verse 30. And are we going to read the verse 30? We're going to read the rest. We could, but we're not, though. For the ships of Shittim that shall come against him, therefore he shall be grieved and return, having indignation against the Kadesh covenant. So this man, this beast, this ruler has anger against the set apart agreement. Why would he have anger against it? So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Kadesh covenant. Remember, that Hebrew word for intelligence is to teach. I pulled a Hebrew word up for it, though. Give me one second, y'all. Sir. Yeah, that's right. Then he got, it's the Benita word for understanding. He's going to teach them. He's going to cause them to understand. To observe and to mark and to give heed. To consider. This man's going to sit down and, what do you think that he could be teaching them people? You know what he's going to be sitting down and teaching them people? The same thing that the serpent taught Eve in the garden. Surely you will not die. You won't surely die. Let's look at what he taught in the garden since I said it. Genesis chapter 3. Here what the beast going to be, because he did get, he told her the truth, but it wasn't, a, but, it, but it was a lie at the same time. Because she did surely die. Not right then. And, and Yah said truly that they are made like one of us. Now they like Ali. Now they like God. He certainly didn't lie to her. But yet he lied to her in the same breath. And it's leading up to something. I promise it is. Genesis 3 and 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which Yahuwah Elohim had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, have Elohim said, You shall not eat of the tree of the garden? The woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, Elohim hath said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. 
Falahim doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open and you shall be at God's knowing good and evil. And you know it's funny because, of course, this is speculation to a certain extent. Will we not think that the beast would tell people that they would not surely die if they if they don't if they take his mark, knowing that people would be preaching that you will surely die if you do so? Let's look at Revelation chapter eleven. Eleven and one. And it was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the Malachim stood, saying, Rise, measure the temple of Elohim and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple, leave out. Measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. And the cottage city shall they tread under foot forty and two months. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the Elohim of the Arabs. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceed out of their mouth and devour their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut Shamahim that it rain not in the days of their prophecy. And have power over the waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Now I ask y'all again for clarification so you know what two prophets had this ability and power. Who did it and where is it located? Who did what he just said that they had the power that they had power to do? Elijah. And what chapter did he do it in? Do you know where he did it at? Or who he did it to? If you don't know where the book, chapter, and verse is, do you know the situation of what happened when he did it? Let's just like I said, if you don't know the book, chapter, and verse, that's cool. But who knows the story and what he did? What'd you say, Carol? Sadly, he was fighting against somebody at one meeting. Nah, he wasn't fighting against nobody. He wasn't fighting against nobody. You can find this in 2 Kings chapter 1. Do you know what he did, Little Muffin? What did he do, Little Muffin? No, that's not the one. He did that, but that's not the one. When he made fire come down from Shamahim or lightning come down from heaven, that's when he would go in to see Ahab and he kept sending people out there to holler at him and he would ask him for fire to come down and kill him. That's why in Luke chapter 9, when the apostles said, should we call for fire from heaven like Elijah? And the master had to tell him, you don't know what manner of Ruach you have. And this witness has the power to do this. So y'all should know who turned water into blood. That's very easy. Y'all should know who turned water into blood. Moses did. So they have the power. So what you see is you see a plague that came against Pharaoh. And you see the plague. Let me make sure that was Ahab that was sending these people out there to him. My memory says Ahab. Memory says Ahab, and it was Ahab. Oh, my bad. I'm in chapter 3. Yeah, that's a it was a uh, that was a king of Yasharai, and the king's name who he was dealing with. Oh, that was Azaziah, Azaziah that died. This is and this is happening. Yeah, this was Azaziah who we were dealing with. That's King, and this is right before Elijah gets taken up on high, that he begins to do this. So you need to understand that that when they say they're gonna be divided by the, he can be able to call for fire. You know what I'm saying? And y'all gonna kill him on the spot. He's gonna be able to give the people blood to drink, the same way that he did to Pharaoh, and punishment for their iniquities. For punishment for trying to harm them. Because you got to remember what the book says. Touch not my prophets and do them no harm. And you see the manifestation of that right here. Do not touch my anointed and do them no harm. 
This also allows y'all to understand one thing so you can know the timeline of things. I told you this before. When you see them two witnesses going to prophecy, then you know they got three and a half years. You got three and a half years to get your mind right from that point. You know what I'm saying? Because once they done, it starts to go down. Because the beast ain't getting off while they prophesying. This is the mercy of Yah. He going to give you three and a half years to get your mind right. He going to bear witness and testify against people for three and a half years years why do you think it said this man in daniel 11 came back and he was mad against the kadesh covenant because they're prophesying it they're speaking it he don't like it he said he was grieved and he returned he got indignation against it let's see what ends up happening with his indignation verse 7 of revelation 11 and when they shall have and finished their testimony the beast that is sent out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them and their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Mishraim, where also our master was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. They that dwelt upon their wrath shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the rest and after three days and a half the ruach of life from Elohim entered into them and they stood upon their feet and great fear fell upon them which saw them and when they heard a great voice from Shamahim saying unto them come up hither they ascended up to Shamahim in the cloud and their enemies beheld them and the same hour there was a great earthquake and the tenth part of the city fell and in the earthquake was slain of men seven thousand and the remnant were affrighted and gave a steam to the Alahim of Shamahim. The second woe was passed. Behold, the third woe come quickly. You have to be like, you have to be ready for these things. That's what you need to be looking for. A brother had commented and said that he was like, Man, these brothers had you had these brothers had you had every what's the word? Current event occur as Bible prophecy. You know what I'm saying? And we be simple enough to give heed to it and listen to it and follow behind it. Because we don't be knowing no better. Because we're not really examining what's written. But you can see right here how this man going to have indignation against the Kadesh covenant. And then he's going to have to sit down and make intelligence with those who have forsaken it. He's going to have to give them understanding. you got to remember that from Daniel 8. He's going to have, un Daniel 8 and 24 to be specific. This man's going to have understanding, well verse 23 actually, understanding of dark sentences. So he's going to understand a little bit of word. He's going to know a little bit of word. In order to deceive the people, you have to know a little bit of word. That's why we read Genesis chapter 3. You can't deceive the people if you don't know no word. So you've got to know just enough to play on the people's weaknesses. See, I've told you this before. I'll tell you how dumb people is. And, 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 and I say that in the most uh, genuine and caring way possible when I say how dumb people are. Because I said it came to my mind when I was looking at the video, you know, what 50 did with popping off. But he said something real. He said, I give them niggas, he said, I give these niggas the game, but they don't want to try to hear me because they think I'm trying to pull a fast one on them. See, you got people, right? If you tell somebody, hey, man, you weak in this area, you weak in this area, and you're making them cognizant and aware of it, they will think that you'll be trying to manipulate and get over on them and pull a fast one on them because you told them. When actually people who pull fast ones on people because of their weaknesses don't tell you. They're not going to tell you. They're just going to exploit it. I know this because I had a young woman get in my car. It was very, very stagnant. She was weeping about many, many different things that troubled her in her life. You know what I'm saying? And one of those things was how men were getting over on her and she just couldn't seem to understand why. She knew, but she didn't know. And she didn't even realize that these men could see the blood, smell the blood. They could taste it. They could see the weaknesses. And they exploited them. Because I tell you, like for a woman to know, if a man actually loves you, he will share with you your weaknesses and, and allow you to either be able to work them out on your own or allow you to or work with them with you. Because if a man's praying on you, he ain't finna tell you where you weak at. He gonna spot it. Oh, got me one. And he gonna juice you for everything that he can get. Until you realize that he doing it. He ain't gonna tell you. 
If you know anything about warfare, that's a reverse tactic in being that bold to tell your enemy where he's weak at and then exploit his weakness boldly in his face. But genuinely, that's not a war tactic that's used because you're giving your enemy a tip on what you're about to attack so they can fortify that weakness. You don't allow weaknesses to be, you don't point out a weakness to give your opponent a chance to fortify it, to make it strong so they can protect themselves. That's retarded if you're going to attack that. So that's why you have to take the things of the word because the enemy knows each and every last one of y'all weaknesses and he will try to exploit it. And you have to fortify those weaknesses with the word to make yourself strong in those areas to where he cannot exploit them. That even goes for some of the people you call friends or brothers and sisters in the word. They know your weaknesses. They seek to exploit them. This is what wicked people do. Nevertheless, what was we at beforehand? Isaiah chapter 64. I don't want to get too far into it. So when we look at verse 2 as the when the melting fire burn, the fire caused the waters to boil, to make thy name known to thine adversaries, that the nations may tremble at thy presence. So when you look at that, y'all should know when the melting fire burns. Because he told you, come back, he'll plead with fire and a sword. Shamahim will be rolled up like a scroll, and everything will be set on fire. He's coming back with fire. Y'all should already know that. You should know that when he returns, he's going to make his name known to his adversaries. Because Deuteronomy 7 and 9 tells you he's going to pay his enemies back to their face. And they will know the name of Yahuwah. Why will they know the name of Yahuwah? This hit my head the other day when they were mentioned, so I guess we'll do it now. Because he said his name going to be known to his adversary. Let's see how his name is known. Genesis 41. I just throw it in there. Some of y'all seen it. Some of y'all may have not. They're going to know his name. They're going to let that be known. He's going to let that be known, I should say. 41 and 32. My apologies. 37. Just bring some things to your remembrance just to sit back and just to deal with something in a little different fashion. And the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and the eyes of all his servants. Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such as one as this? Is a man in whom the Ruach of Elohim is. And Pharaoh said unto Yosef, For as much as Elohim have showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word shall my people be ruled. Only in throne will I be greater than thou. And Pharaoh said unto Yosef, See, I have set thee over the, all the land of Mishraim. And Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand and put it upon Yosef's hand and arrayed him in a vesture of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck. And he made him to ride in the second chariot. And he said, they cried before him, bow the knee. And he made him ruler over all the land of Mishraim. Notice that he said, they cried before him. And he told everybody to bow the knee. That's no, just hold on, hold on. I get it. I get it. Nevertheless, Isaiah 45. Oh, just hold on. Say everybody said they came before him, told him, you don't have to bow that knee. You're going to have to pay homage. Because he said he's going to make his name known to his adversaries. And the nations that the nations may tremble. We already know that an earthquake went down. Zechariah 14 tells us that. We already read that. And we know that the people, Little Muffin mentioned it a little earlier ahead of time. It said in Revelation 5 or Revelation 6 and 15, how these people will run up under the mountains and ask the mountains to fall on them. To hide them from the land because the land because they're trembling now. See, it was all good just a week ago. Y'all were hanging out, chilling with the beast. Everything was lovely. You know what I'm saying? The serpent you knew got them popping. Now he done showed up. Now you scared. All because you said there's no hope for us. We're just gonna walk after the imagination of our own evil heart. Cause you wicked. You had no expectation or hope of receiving salvation. And I get something out of Joel chapter three with that. We try to touch everything, man. Screw it. 45 and 22. Isaiah 45 and 22. Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the rats. For I am Elohim and there is none else. I have sworn by myself the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness. That means that word done went out in faith. It sh and it shall not return. Shall not return. That means he ain't going back on what he said. When he tended to say he swore in his name, he said it came out of his mouth in righteousness, he's not turning back, that means ain't nothing can occur that's going to change that. That's going to happen, what he's about to say. That unto me 
every knee should, shall bow and every tongue shall swear. Surely shall one say in Yahuwah, have I righteousness and strength? Even to him shall men come and all that are sensed against him shall be ashamed. Now notice how we just sat back and seen how the beast was enraged and now we didn't read the verse. Come over here to Psalm 63 real fast though. Oh, I prayed the Lamb. Psalm 63. Psalm 63 and 7. Psalm 63 and 7. After that, Joel chapter 3 and then we'll uh Swing on back round and look at how the nations were sensed against him. And we'll look at how he say, want to have righteousness and strength. Even to him shall men come. He said, because thou hast been my help, therefore in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. My soul follow hard after thee. Thy right hand uphold me. But those that seek my soul to destroy it shall go into the lower parts of their rats. They shall fall by the sword. They shall be a portion for foxes. But the king shall rejoice in Elohim. Every one that swear by him shall esteem. But the mouth of them that speak lies shall be stopped. Keep that in mind when he say the mouth of them that speak lies will be stopped. Notice that he said his enemies will be cut down with a sword. And that they would be meat for foxes. Does anybody have a general idea of what this could mean when he said that they'll fall by the sword and their portion of beef for foxes because they saw his soul to destroy it? Therefore, they got to dwell in the lower parts of the earth. Does anybody have an idea what this could be referencing? Well, we'll look at how they fall by the sword. And all this here and how all the nations are incensed and enraged. Revelation 11. After that, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Revelation 11 and 15. Actually, just verse 18. We just straight to the point and keep it moving and dip. And we go to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And then uh, John chapter 7. Well, we got to read verse 15 here. Yeah, I can't even really do that. And the seventh Malachim sounded. There was a great voice in Shamahim saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of Yahuwah and of his Mashiach, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders which sat before Elohim on their seats fell upon their faces and worshipped Elohim, saying, We give thanks, O Yahuwah Elohim Almighty, which art and was and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and has reigned. And the nations were angry. Thy wrath is come in the time of the dead that they should be judged and that thou should give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the Kadeshim, and to them that fear thy name, small and great, and should destroy them which destroy the earth. Now remember Isaiah 45 say those that are sensed against thee shall be ashamed. We need to see what, what brings shame. Does anybody know what brings shame? It's two things according to the word bring shame. Does anybody know what those things are? Sin is one. That's Proverbs 14, 34. Because sin is a reproach and sin is shame. And it's another thing because I posted a meme with the verse in it about being shame, which is showing you another instance about those who are not chosen. What are they? Proverbs 29, I want to say. Come over here to Proverbs 29. Because he said they'll be ashamed. So we got to see why they're ashamed. We got to see why they're ashamed. We just got to see. Proverbs 29 and 15. Pray the Lamb. Ah, oh, that's even better to verse up on it. Praise Yah. Listen to what he say. 29 and 15 in the book of Proverbs says, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bring his mother to shame. When the wicked are multiplied, transgression increaseth. But the righteous shall see their fall. That last verse, verse 16, when he say, when the wicked are multiplied, transgression increases. You know, the master says, son, along them lines, 
Do you know what? Does anybody know what the master said that was along those lines? You know, the master made a statement in uh, in uh, what you call it? In Matthew twenty-four, most people quote it all the time, and that statement is, he said, because iniquity will abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Wouldn't you say that's almost a parallel statement? That's almost a parallel statement where Proverbs said, when the wicked wicked are increased. Transgression will multiply because when the love of many whack cold, because wickedness is increasing, what is causing wickedness to increase? Because in the last days you have perilous times, men will be lovers of themselves and boasters and blasphemers and inventors of pride and disobedient to parents and all those other things that Paul mentioned. And we live in those times. Men are lovers of themselves more than Elohim, pleasers of themselves more than Elohim. All people want to do, and this is, and, and that type of behavior is evidence of someone who has not been chosen to salvation. Dang, we can hear that concert from where we are. Was that fireworks? You know, they're having a concert tonight. A real, real big one. Rockville. But that's that Metropolitan Park. We were kind of far from Metropolitan Park. Yeah. Was that thunder? No, oh, that's fireworks, and that's definitely from that show. I'm shooting fireworks for the white kids. But I can't even say white kids, white adults, because those bands were bands when I was a teenager. Do you know what I'm saying? And them niggas were grown men then. Do you know what I'm saying? They had to be in their early 20s then, at least. Do you know what I'm saying? Because I seen one, Soundgarden, that's like 97, 96. No, this nigga about 50. Probably with leather pants on, still got long hair. You're old, sir. Give that up. Nevertheless, when he sit back and he say that rod and reproof brings shame, or a child left to itself brings shame. Let's look and see what that could mean in Hebrew chapter twelve. It's okay, new muffin. Hebrews twelve. And verse 7, verse 6. For whom you who will love, he chastened and scourge every son whom he received. If you endure chastening, Elohim dwell, deal with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasten not? But if you be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then ye are bastards and not sons. Can anybody think of a man who was not chastised? Who did wrong and he received no chastisement? I can think of two. They ain't get no chastisement for they sin. None. Anybody can think of anybody? That is true. Eli's sons did not get any chastisement from y'all. They did not. That's first Samuel chapter two. Eli's sons despise the sacrifices of Yah and were laying with women at the door of the tabernacle. Do you read about any chastisement that they received? They caused their father shame to the point because Eli didn't restrain them that there could be no sacrifice for sins to remove that blot from Eli's house. Can anybody else think of anybody who received no chastisement from Yah? I thought that's why they got killed though. That's the only reason I can say that. They got killed because that was their judgment. That wasn't their chastisement though. The chastisement is for maybe you might turn from your sin. Yeah, yeah, okay. Anybody got anybody else who didn't get chastised for their sin? Cause we can't even say that. Cause Cain got chastised for his, whether people realize it or not. He put he put a mark on his head and told him he had to move. Saul didn't get chastised for his sins. He just got straight cut off. Where do you read any? I was thinking about, um, Go ahead. I was thinking about um, Joseph's brothers. Joseph's brothers didn't get chastised for their sins. Yeah, they 
Now they got Chad Tyker. Remember one of them got sold and they were in sore distress because Benjamin had got what well, they thought Benjamin had got taken. They were in sore distress. Their chastisement was a little different. They were very saddened about that. They were so sad they were scared to go back and tell Jacob what had occurred. They got the chance to be able to uh to have that despair. Yeah. Yeah. Cause they were scared to go face Jacob after that. As they should have been. Because you ain't had no business selling your brother in the first place. You know what I'm talking about? Esau didn't get chastised for his sin. Did anybody know what Esau's sin was? He despised not for selling it, he despised it. Remember what it said? It's right here in Hebrew 12. Matter of fact, we right here by it. Let's look at it. 12 and 16. Or 12 and 15. Look diligently, lest any man fall of the favor of Allahim, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know that afterwards he would have inherited the blessing. He was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. That man had to despise. He hated. He, and, and you know if he despised his birthright, First Thessalonians four and eight. Let's see who he really hated. Oh, that's Timothy. That's why I'm like that. Doesn't say that right there. That's not supposed to be there. First Thessalonians four and eight. He therefore that despised, despised not man, but Elohim, who have also given unto us his Ruach HaKadosh. So if so if, if Esau despised their birthright, what did he who did he really hate? Who gave the birthright? Elohim gave the birthright. He had a problem with that. That made him angry. That's what made the beast angry. He's mad at the Kadesh covenant. He got a problem with the birthright. He got a problem with the birthright. Think about that. He got a problem with the promise of Elohim. You know how sick that is? What is the promise? What is the prom what is in the birthright? Who knows what promises are in the birthright? Which this also will cause the beast to be upset. And this will also cause, well, let me read this John 7 and 7 first. Let's read this John 7 and 7 first. Which will cause those who are not chosen to hate you. Let me read this John 7 and 7 first. The world cannot hate you because but me it hate because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. That's what y'all need to realize, son, right? When Mashiach is in you and you and Mashiach and you walking in the world, you are a walking testimony against the world and they will hate you for it. See, I keep telling y'all, man, I tell y'all over and over and over again. You know, and it seems like it a little bit more recently, but I've said it in the past, little muffler can bear witness. You know what I'm saying? People's not supposed to really, people have a very, 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 very bad representation of who Yahusha really is. Because it's different when you're reading it off the text versus if you would have heard him speak. Versus if you would have been standing right there. This was a very hard man. I've told y'all before, he was a compassionate man, he was a loving man, he was a kind man, he was a knowledgeable man, he was a wise man, he's an understanding man, but he was a very hard man. He didn't play no games and he spared no feelings. He did not move by feelings, nor was he concerned with the feelings of those around him, as forth as what his words might do to their feelings. He was not concerned with that. He was concerned with doing the will of his father in Shamahim and bringing souls to repentance. He was not concerned with your feelings. So, notice that he didn't leave his son to his own devices. He chastised him. Therefore, he didn't leave his mother in shame. You notice that these men ended up being left to shame their mother to a certain extent because they received no chastisement. That is a hallmark of those whom he have not chosen because we just read here in Hebrew 12, those whom he loved, he scourged. 
He beats them. He chastises them. As many as I love, I chasten and rebuke. So it's two things that happen to those that are not chosen. They're not chastened for their sins, or when they're chastened for their sins, they, re they refuse the chastening and flee from it, or the chastening causes them to be angry. They abhor it. They hate it. And because of this, this will allow the wicked to increase. But he said the righteous shall see their fall. Because we know Luke, Matthew 24 tell you, because the iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Now, why is it able for the beast to be able to get all these people to listen to him and follow him? Because the wicked are increased and they're increasing day by day. Let's see why. Second, Second Thessalonians, bro. Chapter 2. Is that Second Thessalonians chapter 2? I ain't getting too off the track. Really, I'm on the track all the time. Go ahead, little muffin. You had to get all three of them? All three. All three. They ain't hurt too bad because they ain't cry too long. 2 Thessalonians 2 and 3. Just make it 2 and 1. What they were doing in the hallway? Playing in the bathroom? That ain't the place to play. That ain't the place to play. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our master, Yahushua HaMashiach, and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by ruach nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as that day of Mashiach is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. Except there come a falling away first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Who oppose and exalt himself above all that is called Elohim or that is worship, so that he as Elohim sit in the temple of Elohim, showing himself that he is Elohim. Remember ye not that when I t was yet with you, I told you these things. Now notice he say this falling away won't ha that a falling away has to happen for him to be revealed. Well, let's look at something in Second Timothy, and let's see how it causes this stuff to, to call people to fall away. Second Timothy chapter three. Second Timothy chapter three, verse thirteen. I'm gonna get them because they trying you. Make it uh, eleven. Persecutions, afflictions, which come unto me at Antioch and Iconium and Listeria. What persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Master delivered me. Yea, all that will live godly in Yahushua HaMashiach shall suffer persecution. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child thou hast known the Kadesh scriptures, which are able to make these wise unto salvation through faith which is in Yahushua HaMashiach. Oh, that was Leah that time. I thought so. Now, I'm going to ask y'all a question. He said that these men will be deceiving and being deceived. How are these men being deceived? These men that are seeking to seduce the people, how are they being deceived? By their own lust. By their own lust. The very same thing that we started off in Jeremiah reading, ain't it? Then in Isaiah chapter 66, he said, because when he called, he didn't answer. He'll choose out your delusions because you delight in your own way and your abominations. See, you have to watch people. Uh, that's the hallmark, of, again, of somebody who is not chosen because they delight in their own will and in their own way. When you see a person that really wants to do what they want to do and go the way that they want to go. And they'll do it just like most people do. They'll try to cloak it in the word. You know what I'm saying? That's somebody he done already deceived you. Because he got you believing lies. The lies of your own heart. He's giving you over to your own heart. You have to pay attention to that. You have to watch that because that's what happened to Saul. That's what happened to Esau. That's what happened to Cain. That sin deceived him. That's why he say, if you do well, you'll be accepted. But if not, sin lie at the door. Sin has deceived you and by it has slew you. 
Because it made you thought, it made you believe that what your heart desired and what you wanted to do was more profitable than doing what Allahim said to do and what Allahim desired, which is for you to fulfill his will and to walk in his way and serve him. Instead, you lend your member service to sin unto death. Therefore, that's whom you serve. That's your master. That's your ruler. That's your power. Your God is your own belly. You mind earthly things, the things of this life. That which is flesh is flesh. They that are flesh mind the things of the flesh. Everything after its own kind. You're not going to catch no spiritual person with no carnal person for too long. If they don't step away from them, y'all definitely going to separate them. Because these two things can't meet in agreement. You wonder sometimes where some people just can't meet in agreement. There's always contention. There's always strife. There's always headbutting. Always clashing. Because 99.9% .9 of the time, one is of the serpent seed and the other one's of the woman's seed. One is carnal and one is spiritual. And according to the law, there's always going to be enmity or hatred or strife or struggle or contention. They can never move together in harmony. A spiritual person cannot move in harmony with a carnal person on a continual basis. It's not going to happen or the word is a lie. That's why these dudes trip me out. Oh, we supposed to be united. We supposed to be brothers. Not if you carnal. If you carnal, we're always going to have contention or the word is a lie. Does that make sense? Do y'all understand that? Do, do y'all not? Can y'all not see that throughout the whole course of this book? Because Paul wrote you in Galatians chapter 4. Let's read Galatians chapter 4. Let's just read it then. I'll just read it then. I ain't even going to tell you. I'll just read it then. Verse 28, 4 and 28. I still got to reconcile this Psalm 63. Bear with me. I know we got Isaiah 57 on deck. We might get to Psalm 58 tonight. Might not. You know, just see how it goes. Might get to Judges 5 tonight. Might not. Just see how it goes. We're at the 10 o'clock hour. I probably got about another hour and a half, possibly. We'll see how it goes. Now we brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the Ruach, even so it is now. So when we look at that and we sit back and think on it, because most of y'all should be familiar enough with these stories that we don't necessarily have to go in great detail. Those that are not familiar with, the, with them need to, uh, you know, let that be known so I can tell you where they are so you can read them for yourselves. Uh, you can see that Cain persecuted Abel because one was carnal and one was not. You can see that Jacob didn't get along with Esau because one was carnal and one was not. Isaac didn't get along with Ishmael because one was carnal and one was not. Hamashiach didn't get along with the people because they were carnal and he was not. He told them, you are from this world. I am not from this world. I am from above. You are from beneath. That's why they wanted to kill him. They couldn't meet an agreement with this man. This is why the people had a problem with Jeremiah because he was spiritual and they were not. Don't let no man deceive you when it comes to that, that you think that you just cause a nigga know he an Israelite or they keep a Sabbath, that you can meet an agreement with them and they're carnal and you are not. You will clash. There will be contention. There will be strife. There will be discord between you because you were never united in the first place. Because the law is clear on that in the third chapter of Genesis, that there shall be enmity between the woman's seed and the serpent's seed. There will be enmity between those who are born of the devil and those who are born of Elohim. And the law is showing you from the beginning that there are those who are chosen and those who are not. That's why the beast had enmity against the two witnesses and wanted to kill them. And that's why the people were jumping around singing and dancing and sending each other gifts. Because they could never meet an agreement with these two men. How could they? They are not the patients of the Kadeshim. They are not the ones who guard the commandments of Elohim, nor have the testimony and faith of Yahusha. How could they ever meet an agreement with these two men? It's not going to happen. See, people look at stuff, man, and they be like, you know, you see discord, and you see separation, and you see contention, and you wonder why. Is this the first time I ever said this? No, it's not. And you wonder why. 
this is what I mean about knowing the finer points of the book and being able to point out and understand and to know what is going on before you. So you can understand. This is giving you the understanding of the reading in real life. You can see in real, well, shoot, now I know why that went like that or why this is going like that. You know what that allows you to be able to do? Endure. A lot of the men who suffer things in the word because they understood their Elohim, then when the suffering came, they were able to endure it because they already knew him and what they had to face. So it didn't bother them. Because their hearts were already prepared for it and they were going to wait on their Elohim. Jeremiah didn't say, bust me up out of prison. Same way the master told Peter, I could get 12 legions of Malachim right now, but the scriptures got to be fulfilled. I will wait on Elohim because I have a hope and expectation from him. So your hope and expectation got to come from him. Therefore, you will wait on him and you will endure whatever it is that you have to take to get it. See, that's what I meant when I said to tell you like. I get upset when I see, like to say, I'm talking to my homeboy, man, and he like to say, man, you know, our opportunities are limited. And I went off on him, too, because I, I go off on him every time he say that. I don't want to hear that junk right there, man. And there's a reason why I want to hear that. The only not, and, and I broke it down to him all the way live, too, on, on some real tight time, also understanding where he coming from. If you work for another man, then yes, your opportunities are limited because your opportunities are only based upon the opportunities that he's willing to offer you. You know what I'm saying? Like if you if you work at a particular company, your promotion is only contingent on the person above you allowing you to get it. Do you know what I'm saying? Your opportunities are only limited to if you're asking someone for a job, you're limited to that this person has the ability to tell you no. Now, of course, we know spiritually and scripturally that if Yah be with you, he'll move anyone to have compassion on you because you have returned unto him and pledged your cause unto him and poured out your soul and forsake all manner of iniquity and ungodliness. But then we just sit back on a natural level where most of our people roll at. You understand what I'm saying? Most of our people are on that level. That's how they think. So you have to look at it in this aspect. Your options are limited. Your opportunities are limited when... You may or may not have certain levels of education because we don't see people who have high levels of education and they tell them they're overqualified and their opportunities are limited. We see people who have little to no education and their opportunities seem to be limited. But when you decide to create something and start something on your own, your opportunities that are only based on how hard you're willing to work. That means your opportunities are endless. No one could put a limit on your opportunities but you. But you. So that's why I tell him, I don't want to hear that because that white man that started Under Armour ain't no better than none of y'all. What makes him any better than y'all? He's seen a need. He's seen a void. He filled the void. And he put the work in to be the second largest apparel retailer in the world. In 21 years. In 21 years. That white man ain't no better than damn one of y'all. Y'all can easily see a void or a need, or whether it be a product or a service, and create it and fill it. And in 21 years, you could be done did, been done did the same thing. All you had to do was just go hard. But you know where most niggas mess up at? When the white folks go to sniffing around talking about they want to buy your company, you be ready to sell it. So you can stunt with a little bit of change, like Robert Johnson did with BET. So you could be the little token nigga boy who got a billion dollars, but now we done took your company, which you built up, which was actually, at, at, to a certain extent, beneficial to black people, save a few things here and there to the monstrosity that you see at this very moment. Because I know TV One is a black network, but do black people actually own it? I don't know. Probably not, though. Just like I heard the Dame Dad say, you niggas sold Rockefeller twice. Who wear, I mean, Rockefeller twice. Who wears that now? You sold it to Caucasians. It ceased to no longer exist. It no longer exists. Because I've said this numerous times. Bill Gates ain't selling Microsoft to no black man. And nor should he. Because if I was him, I wouldn't do it. 
The Ford Motor Company is not selling that company to no black man. And if I was them, I wouldn't do it. There's nothing wrong with them doing not doing that. You have to understand that. Why would they build something up to sell it to another people? Why wouldn't you keep that amongst your own people? That's common sense. You're supposed to take care of your own people first. There's, there's nothing wrong with for white people taking care of white people. They're supposed to. Black people are supposed to take care of black people. There's nothing wrong with Asian people taking care of Asian people. They're supposed to. We're the only group of people that don't seem to understand that it is better to take care of your own first. We buy the lie that America is inclusive and to include everybody, though every nationality of people in this country look out for their own kind first. And then you try to make these people feel bad for doing it, and there's nothing wrong with that. You are not going to look out for the next door neighbor's children before you take care of your own. And when I say the next door neighbor, meaning some people that's not a part of your familiar group. If they're part of your familiar group or part of your family, then of course you're going to look after them like you look after your own because you're one and the same. But you ain't going to take care of the next door neighbor children and they're not of your family. Shoot, boy, I got to take care of mine before I worry about them. If we got something, man, we'll be able to help you out. We don't think like that. We'd be ready to sell our company and ball with the white man money and throw it in niggas' face. Look, look, look what I got. Look what I got. Look what I got. Look what Mr. Charlie let me buy. Versus keeping it and keeping it going and passing it on. Man, ain't nobody, ain't nobody own no Rockefeller oil companies. That stuff stayed in the family. The DuPont dynasty, that stuff stayed in the family. The Heinz uh, empire, that stayed in the family. The Vanderbilt empire, that stayed in the family. The Kennedy empire, that junk was built all bootlegging. That stayed in the family. Who is that, man? Let me go back to Psalm 63 real quick. See what verse I need to clean up out of that. Yeah, praise y'all for the word. Y'all tell you that. He'd say, hey, man, I look out for mine first. Oh, yeah, we were dealing with the knee bound. So, nevertheless, right? We see how he say all these people were insane, incensed at him and ashamed. Revelation 1 and 7. And let's look at how they end up being ashamed. End up being ashamed. Because he told you in Matthew 24 that all the tribes of the earth shall mourn. I know I called for Joel chapter 3. We'll get to it eventually. Most high willing. Most high willing. Going a little different direction than I intended. I might only get one verse out of uh, Psalm 58, but it's all good though. Praise Yah either way. He said, Behold, he come with clouds, and every sh eye shall see him, and they shall also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him, even so I mean. I am the Aleph and the Ta, the beginning and the ending, saith the Master, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. You know, one day we're going to have to deal with that too. The which is and which was and which is to come. We kind of dealt with it to a certain extent. But we got to deal with that one now. Kind of dealt with that with him being slain from the foundation of the world. But got to reconcile that statement, you know. Knowing that these people going to be ashamed that is coming. Now, when he say that they'll be thrown in the holes, they'll be slain by the sword and be left for the foxes. That's your Revelation 19 where he come back with the sword in his mouth to smite the earth. And that, it, and that the birds and all the animals come and feed on the kings of the earth's bodies. Because they step to him. And their mouth, let me read that last verse in Psalm 63 because I don't want to quote it wrong. You know, the, you know, the end times seem to be a scary thing for people when they really ain't scared. And then we'll get that Joel chapter 3 after that. They really ain't scared. It's only scary if you're a sinner. But it said, the king shall rejoice in Elohim, and everyone that swear by him shall esteem. But the mouth of them that speak lies will be stopped. So, we'll get Joel 3 and then slide to Psalm 58. Real quick, like. Do it like that. Joel 3 and 15, if I'm not mistaken. I got to try to get the valley of him now, man. Hopefully we can slide that on in. 
I think we done dealt with it before though. Just detailing where it's at, where they gonna go, how they gonna burn. Burn, baby, burn. See, I'm gonna tell you something, right? Yeah, Joel 3 and 15. I'm gonna tell you something, right? Like, people don't like when you talk about eternal damnation. Oh, you know what I'm saying? We did, I we would much rather, I like this here, right? And I've said this several times before in my lifetime, too, doing this here. We would much rather talk about the things that pertain to the kingdom and all the beautiful things that he had prepared and all the mighty things. That, even though in the midst of talking about eternal damnation, we are talking about eternal salvation and the things he has for those who love him. But, uh, yeah, people out here wilding, man. You know what I'm saying? That don't really benefit the people when you talk about things that 95% of them won't even receive. You know what I'm saying? Let's just go ahead and be real with that. 90, and I'm just using that number. 95% of the people are not even going to receive nothing that Yahuwah has promised. Because they're filthy, detestable, evil, wicked children. Rebellious children. You know what I'm saying? Refuse to come under rule and authority. Despise it. Despise it. But yet want to pretend to be righteous. And that's why he said you got to be careful because evil men are out here deceiving and, and, and being deceived. You know what I'm saying? Taking silly women, laden with diverse lust, captive. You know what I'm saying? You had to sit back and look at that stuff, man. Everything after its kind. Everything after its kind. Just like the law say, man. Everything after its kind. Sinners with sinners. Carnal people with carnal people, spiritual people with spiritual people. Man, I promise to you, man, I'm a firm believer in this. I remember somebody questioned me on it about a year ago. I'm a firm believer of it because the master said it. He said, well, Allahim have brought together that no man bring asunder. And when I look at that, of course, in that particular verse, in Mark 10, he referring to two people being married. But we can see this man all throughout the world through multiple different avenues, not necessarily a marriage, bringing people together. Taking certain people and setting them in the same pathway at the same time so they could be joined together to bring esteem to his name. I'm a firm believer that that man does that. I have book to back that. Do you know what I'm saying? Because like this here, I can sit back and look at that he brought David and Abigail together. And he just went ahead and killed Nabal to get him out of the way to get that woman where he wanted her at and who he wanted her with. You know what I'm saying? Brought David and Jonathan together because he wanted them joined together to bring apart his will because that's who he wanted him joined to. Jonathan was not a wicked man. He said he loved Jonathan like his own soul. Right after his own kind, he was down with somebody who was just like him. There's many other lo there's many other places like that. He brought Isaac and Rebecca together. That was his will, that was his desire. Rebecca was just as much a soldier for Yahuwah as Isaac is. He brought Rachel and Leah together. I mean, I mean Leah, Rachel, Leah, and Jacob together. And Rachel was just as much as a soldier as Jacob was, because she around here hiding idols, playing it wrong, risking risking something happening to her to stand or to, to get rid of them idols. She like this here, no nah, man, nah, nah, y'all ain't keeping this around here. A straight soldier. He just brought Leah into the plate for something else. But he brought Rachel and he brought Rachel and Jacob together for a reason. For a cause. You know what I'm saying? Nehemiah and and and, and Yahushua, son of Jehoshadak, brought together for a cause. Ezra and Nehemiah brought together for a cause. Men of like minds. The apostles and Amashiach brought together for a cause. Men of like minds. We don't even pay attention that that man does that. We just really think you just meet people by happenstance. This man brings people together for a reason. We just be too stupid to pay attention to it. A lot of times you sit back, and, at least that I done seen in my lifetime, we'll try to fight. The people that he trying to bring you to to be close, close to or unite you with that are actually of him. And he only does that to really show that you're not of him. So when he discards you, he won't feel bad about it. 
Because how can you love someone who's a representation? If you don't love someone who's a representation of him on the earth, you definitely can't love him. It's going to be impossible. John tells you that. If you can't say if you don't love your brother whom you have seen, how can you love Elohim whom you have not seen? If you say you love Elohim and you don't love his children, ain't no way in the world you can love him. You know what I'm saying? Because more people feel like, and I think it's Christian. I think, I'm, I'm just my opinion. I think it's more Christian thinking. You thinking that the people of y'all are just happy, joy, joy, love, love, love. I love you, brother. It's okay if you sin. Y'all loves you. It's okay. That's how they think that you think. Or they're going to go along with everything you do or condone everything that you do. And that's not the sons of Elohim. You don't see that no, you don't see no son of Elohim operate like that in his book. Gideon was hard. He didn't play with them people. Yahushua son of Nun did not play with them people. Moses did not play with them people. This book say Moses was the most meekest man on the earth and took a golden calf and burnt it and made the people drink it. Now how many people would think he surely can't be a God? He got them people drinking that calf. How he gonna melt that down and make them people drink that? That's what he did though. Abraham was a man of Elohim. He told the king of Sodom, nigga you won't give me not near nary coin. Because you ain't going to be able to open your mouth and say, you did nothing for me, nigga. Every person that walked around, he couldn't be a God talking like that. That man done did it. Why could he say that? They don't really see the harshness and the hardness and the realness of all these men of Elohim throughout this book. These were real dudes who ain't care nothing about your feelings. And we're going to keep it a buck and we're going to tell you the truth, whether you liked it or not. But people say, you know, tell them what they want to hear. 3 and 15, man. Joel, man, screw it, man. Verse 13 again. We read it the other day. Read it again. It ain't going to hurt nothing. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full. The fats overflow, for the wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of you who is near in the valley of decision. The sun and moon shall be darkened, and the stars shall withdraw their shining. Shining, my apologies. Yahuwah shall also also shall roar out of Zion, utter his voice from Jerusalem, and the Shalahims and the rats shall shake. But Yahuwah will be the hope of his people and the strength of the children of Yasharal. Now, didn't we just read in Isaiah 45 where this man says, uh, yeah, that righteousness and strength, even to him shall men come. But all that are sent to him shall be ashamed. So those who have faith and strength, because remember, where the word where the word of the king is, there's power. That's Ecclesiastes 8 and 5. Where the word of the king is, there's power. So we say all those that have righteousness and strength is going to come to him. So we know in John chapter 6, the master said, No man can come unto me except the Father which sent him draw who have sent me draw him. He said, all those who are taught of Elohim, it says, written in the prophets, they all shall be taught of Elohim. Therefore, all that have been taught of Elohim and have heard, come unto me. So let's look at Romans 10 and 1. So you got to consider that. Those who are of the faith, remember he say righteousness and strength. That's why he say we are glad, we always give thanks to the master, beloved. Uh, say always give thanks to you. I, I just got to read, come quote me wrong. After we read the Romans 10, man, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We just go ahead and read it. I ain't say it right. I mean, we're supposed to read it, but I don't say it right. Romans 10 and 1. He said, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to Elohim for Yasharal is that they might be saved. For I bear them record, they have a zeal of Elohim, but not according to knowledge. This people's very passionate and very jealous and zealous for Elohim. Yet not according to what the man told you. He told you he desired to knowledge Elohim more than sacrifice. He say some of you have not the knowledge of Elohim. I speak this to your shame. This is why I be saying the stuff I be saying. People don't really know the word, and y'all supposed to know it. And like I say, man, sometimes I say, you know, be a little bit more specific. I promise to you, you who will give me strength and keep it in my mind. All that general stuff, I'm not accepting no general answers. That's don't need to be specific. You need to know, you need to show forth that you have the knowledge of Elohim. You know what I'm saying? That you know. Because the knowledge of Elohim will lead you to have the skill in battle, which will lead to allow you to have the insight that you can be able to discern and to know, which means no man can deceive you. 
And I can't give you that. Only Yahuwah can give you that. But you got to give yourself that from doing two things. Well, allow yourself to receive that. Let me rephrase myself. And that's by hearing the word, obeying the word, and believing the word. And most important, my part, I said it wrong. You need to be reading, you need to hear it, and you need to do it. Just like we read in Revelation chapter 1. You need to be reading, you need to hear. So when it's preached, when you hear, you believe, and you need to put it in action. You need to be around here doing some Shamar. You need to be hearing what the intent to do. And you need to be reading. That way, because then you'll have the knowledge. When you have the knowledge, you will apply it. When you apply it, then you have the skill to fight. When you have the skill to fight, you get the insight. You get the understanding. No man can deceive you at that point. A lot of people getting deceived because their heart ain't into it. A lot of people getting confused and manipulated because your heart wasn't into it. Because you wasn't reading, you wasn't hearing, and you wasn't doing. Therefore, you leave yourself susceptible to all manner of evil. And that's nobody's fault but your own. He said, for they being ignorant of Elohim's righteousness are going about to establish their own righteousness. Have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of Elohim. For Mashiach is the end of the Torah for righteousness to everyone that believes. He is the purpose. So when you have a heart of faith, that which is of the Ruach is of the Ruach, you will come to him. To get your strength. He said that in, in weakness they were made strong. My favor is sufficient for thee. Because my strength is made perfect in weakness. When you come to this man in a weak state. When I say a weak state. Acknowledging that you are. Like, like Peter said. He said depart from me. I'm an ungodly man. I'm a sinner. The same way in Luke 18. When he said that that, man, that that publican smote upon his chest. And said be merciful upon me. I am a sinner. Because you can't have no power in a state of sin. When you come to that man. And faith and believing. And that weakness. Then he'll give you strength. Because the king of Elohim is not in meat and drink. But in word and in power. You have to know where your strength comes from. That's why that said that in Joel. He said he will be the strength and the hope of his people. Because he'll strengthen you in the inward man. Let's see that. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Four and uh, 16. I'll no, just begin. I'm just stretching out my leg there. It's, uh, my knee's in a lot of pain all the time lately. Don't know what I did to it. For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, work for us a more exceeding and eternal weight of esteem. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. You can't see your salvation right now. It seems afar off. Hebrews 11. See, we don't to spend too much time on the liars, but we finna get them right. He said he gonna stop the mouth of all liars. Oh, new muffin. Hebrews 11 and 13. Well, Hebrews 11 and uh, 10, I suppose. Make it nine or make it eight. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should receive for inheritance, obeyed. He went out, not knowing whether he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is Elohim. And we've had to deal with that one day too Now that it's striking my brain Because you need to be looking for a city with, that have a foundation You know what that foundation is And whose builder and maker is Elohim You're not looking for a natural place to dwell You're looking for a place that Yah himself made That Yah himself built And that's where you need to place your hope You need... We don't have the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I told you this before, and we love to claim them. You know what I'm saying? 
You sit back when well, you sit back and we look at it right now that I'm sitting there thinking about this here. Just thinking about the Patriarchs. Just thinking about them three. Them three men. And their wives. Only because we cause like I said, cause we have to focus on their wives too, because I don't want none of our sisters to think that they're irrelevant and they don't have anybody to model themselves after. And also to sit back and see how you see something where the model of what this man do with her bringing these righteous men and women together. You look at Abraham. This was a man of very strong faith. And though Sarah may have laughed, Sarah was a woman of very strong faith as well. Because it tells you that there, that she even believed, even with the deadness in her womb, and that she even believed the promise of Elohim that in Isaac thy seed shall be called when she told him, if you don't get Ishmael raggedy behind from round here, he will not be an heir with my son. He must depart. Because of the trust and hope that she had in Elohim. That's why, the, that's why he said through the prophet Isaiah. That you need to look to the hole that you would dig from. The hole that you would dig from. Think about that. Abraham is a man of strong faith. It only makes sense that his wife would be one too. What would this man of strong faith be able to do with a woman who had weak faith? She wouldn't do nothing but destroy him. So what did Elohim do? He lines him up with the woman whose faith is as strong as his, though they may have not known it at the time. But when Yahuwah made himself known unto Abraham, this is manifested. Because clearly, they, you sit back and look at it, it could have possibly been contention. We can't read it. Between his wife telling him, you just finna get up and go somewhere because somebody told you to go somewhere? No, she went and still called him master. Why? She trusted in him. She knew what manner of man she was married to, and her faith was as equal to his. Strong people. This is who you who are used. And this is your first father and your first mother. And then they produce Isaac, and, and, and then he marries Rebecca. And then you look at Rebecca. She's wondering why these children are struggling in her womb. And Yah tells her what it is, and her hope and trust is in Yah that she makes sure that that promise is fulfilled. A woman just as strong as her husband. Faith just as strong as her husband's. Because notice he didn't tell Isaac this. Isaac don't know. He tells Rebecca this. And Rebecca believed it. And when she seen, oh, no, 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 no. Esau can't get none of this here. Jacob, come here, son. Don't worry about it. She, matter of fact, her faith was so strong in Yahuwah, she told Jacob, oh, let that reproach be on me, baby. Don't worry about that. Let that fall on me. You just go do what I told you to do. Do you know what I'm saying? And then lastly, you look at, because they don't say much about what Leah making no moves, but when some soldier stuff went down, Rachel is mentioned. I'm finna grab these idols, and I'm finna hide them. And I'm finna sit here and say, oh, it's, I'm after the custom of women right now. I can't get up. A soldier. Putting that risk. Ain't no telling what her daddy might have did. What, what LeBron would have did to her behind that. But she finna ride though. And this the one that Jacob loved. From the moment he saw. Her. And he brought these people together. And these are the people that produced us. We don't sit back and look at none of that. Don't you realize that if Rebecca is journeying with Isaac and Rachel is journeying with Jacob and Sarah is journeying with Abraham, that they're looking for a city which have foundations, who builder and maker is is of is Elohim just like their husband? Man, verse eleven. They finna tell you about Sarah right now anyway. Through faith, also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised therefore sprang there even of one him as good as dead so many as the stars of the sky in multitude as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable these all died in faith not having received the promises but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth that means them women was locked stock with them men and serving and trusting Elohim in the same token and the reason why I mention that there because I keep telling y'all everything after it's kind you can't you can't be an individual whether you be male or female husband and wife friends whatever sister and brother I wouldn't care what it is you can't journey 
with Yahuwah in faith and have somebody with you who's weak in faith because that is going to be a major hindrance for you because you either going to shed them or they're going to bring you down that's, that's all that's going to happen and the book's pretty clear on that and if you notice that people whom he sent on missions he made sure to pair them up with somebody whose faith was just as strong as theirs how are you going to be able to get strength when you're weak when the person next to you is weak now the book do tell you that those of us that are strong ought to support the weak because you are strong that you can get them strong but he ain't finna send nobody on no mission with no weak person though you ain't finna do that because that don't make no sense that's not going to make no sense. There's a difference of somebody being weak and you being there and have compassion on them and strengthening them to lift your brother or sister up or even your wife or even your husband or even your son or even your daughter. That's a whole other thing to go on a mission though. Because if you, you've seen what happened with people weak in faith in the wilderness when he told them to go spy out the land. They discouraged the people and said there's giants in there we can't overtake it. That discouraged everybody else because you saw weak people were sent on a mission with strong people and the voices of the weak drowned out the voices of the strong when they said, oh, surely we could take, take them. They ain't nothing but me for us. Y'all going to handle that. The people couldn't hear that because the voices of the weak were, were, were louder. They were louder. Like I told you, that's just me that's calling the word. I'm going to believe in that. But if you're strong in the faith, that man going to put somebody strong in the faith right there with you. To go do whatever it is he's sending you to go do. He gonna have nobody weak in the faith next to you. Imagine if you had a weak woman and, 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 and imagine Sarah, a weak woman, and she tell and she get told she finna have a baby, she don't believe it. And then she gotta be a she gotta be a pilgrim and go on a journey in a land where she don't know. And why we got to be out here? Why we got to do this here? That is discouraging to anybody if you constantly hear that. And it's your wife, the closest person to you. And you constantly hear that. Nevertheless, for they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And if truly they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country that is a heavenly. Wherefore, Allahim is not ashamed to be called their Allahim. For he have prepared for them a city. This is why, and I read all that because he said this is why when he roar up out of Zion and utter his voice in Jerusalem, that he'll be the strength and hope of his people because you had an expectation of coming into this place. You had an expectation of it. You believed it even though you couldn't see it. And he's coming to reward you. But the mouth of those good old-fashioned liars got to be stopped. That's why he said those that come unto him, they have righteousness and strength in them. And they esteem in him. But those that are incensed in him shall be ashamed. Because they shall be killed. They shall be slaughtered. They shall be put in the grave where they belong. And then woke up and cast into a lake of fire. Where the worm dies not and the fire shall not be quenched. And you shouldn't make no apologies for that. You know what I'm saying? That's, uh, and, I'm t and I'm speaking to the women right now. At this point in time. That's why we took that time a couple months back to look at every single upright and good woman in the word. That's why we took the time to do that. Because y'all need to know that, that even though these stories may not be as detailed and may not be as long as those as men, you should know who these women are. And you should know that these women faith were just as strong as any man's. And any man's. Straight up and down. You need to know that. You need to understand that. You know what I'm saying? Because I know a lot of brews like to minimalize women and you know this, that, that, and the third. Only a, a sodomite would do that. You know what I'm saying? In my opinion, your son got to be fruity about you. You know what I'm saying? That you always... Now, of course, we know a woman can be a man's weakness. This is why the book of Proverbs tells you, say kings are not to give their strength unto women. Because in doing so, it can be to your destruction. You've seen that with Samson, even though that was of Yah to take the Philistines down. But just looking at it in a natural sense, giving your strength and your power unto a woman can be devastating for you. And the man has to guard himself and be able not to do that. But we also know, because I asked a couple of people to look at that, and I ain't going to deal with it tonight because I ain't able to do it. 
But this is also a, a, another token now that I think about it. About that we know he bring people together. Because Proverbs 19 and 14 say a prudent wife is of Yahuwah. The word prudent is a woman who's circumspect. A woman who has insight, understanding, or wisdom. Do you know what I'm saying? You have to think about that type of stuff. Because if you're a prudent woman, then that means, and you come from Yahuwah, that means she's going to give you to a righteous man. That's who he's going to give you to. It's not going to give you to a sinner. That is not going to make any sense. It's going to give you to a righteous man. You have to think about those type of things because everything is worked out to his esteem. And he wants his people to be together to be able to strengthen and comfort one another. Even though the tears will be growing up amongst you, and though they may look like you and their insides are black, if you remember when we dealt with that, you got to you got to have people around you whose faith is strong as yours, who desire to serve Elohim is the same as yours. Because sadly, sadly, everybody's desire and faith is not the same. It's not the same. Nevertheless, what we need Psalm fifty-eight, because we got to deal with him stopping the mouth of these lies. I know I mentioned 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and I need to get it now. 2 and 10 before we go to Psalm 58. Y'all got to help me out sometime, man. You know, my mind's starting to slip. My memory getting bad. Short-term memory anyway. Long-term memory is pretty good, but the short-term memory is getting starting to get bad. 2 and 9. 2 Thessalonians 2 and 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Hashatan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Now I want y'all to keep that in mind because I think we looked at something. He got to stop the mouth of all liars and he say his coming is after Hashatan. And we already read in Daniel how he got a problem with the Kadesh covenant. And you know, we know the, the beast that arise out of the bottomless pit. We know who gave him his seat. We know who gave him his power. The great serpent. That serpent gave him his power. He said, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness. Remember now, sin deceives. Unrighteousness is deceptive. See, I'm going to tell you something about unrighteousness right here, right? Isaiah chapter 30 said, the people say, tell us lies, tell us smooth things, prophecy to us deceits. You know what I'm saying? Say, you know, the evil man, his words are smooth as butter, smooth as oil. Because we like the things, you know, say the people have itching ears and they'll run after fables. You know what I'm saying? So, unrighteousness, the things that are not right, deceive so well. And when you begin to listen to that lie and believe that lie, you tend to always want to hear that lie and always want to believe that lie. And then after that, it's hard for you to come back to the amount, to come back to the truth to the faithfulness, to the soundness, to the firmness, because you built your house upon sand. Because you prefer the lie. You wanted to believe that timeshare was gonna make you millions of dollars. You knew it was a lie, but you just wanted to believe it. Because it would fulfill your lust for riches. You wanna believe that man or woman really wants to serve Yah, though they're showing you no evidence that they have any desire to do so. But you just wanna believe it because you love lies. If you love lies, you love the adversary. Anyone who's of you who will love the truth, don't lie to me. I'm not gonna to lie to myself. You know what I'm saying? Like that young woman I told y'all about it was in my car doing all that weeping, man. And I ain't saying that to be funny because it was very, very sad. Girl was only 19 years old. She knew what the truth was, but because of the desire for certain things that she wanted or that she felt like she was lacking, that if she doesn't give it now, get it now, she may feel like she may never get it. She believed the lies that people were telling her or the lies she was telling herself. All because she was scared to be alone. Not scared to be alone at 19, but scared that no one would ever want her, period, in her life. You know what I'm saying? And through that, because of that weakness and that sadness, that's where the lies are able to come in at, to where you will believe the lies that other people tell you if they appease the thing that you desire. 
And that was just so sad for somebody to be that young to feel like, what if nobody ever wants me? You ain't never, you haven't even lived life yet. You ain't even lived life yet. But that's what, that bothered her. And there were other extenuating circumstances of which I will not delve into at this time. But, yeah, man, that's saddening. Because then you won't, you'll believe lies even though you know this person is lying to you. But you want to believe it so bad. You want to believe it. And that's what sin does. That's what unrighteousness does. You want to believe that it won't harm you. You want to believe it won't separate you from Allahim. You know that it will. You know you take pleasure in your own way, in your own heart, in your own voice. That's why the people say we have no hope. We have no hope. It's no hope for us to be saved. You know how many people I've met doing this word, man? No exaggeration. Doing this word, man, dealing with this word, preaching this word, disseminating the word, whatever you want to say, right? Who, they got out of pocket. You know what I'm saying? You trying to tell them, you know what I mean? Like, hey, man, you got to stop doing what you're doing. You got to get your stuff on point. You got to get it right. This, that, that, and the third. And they just felt like, ain't no hope for me. For what? Come back for what? That's sad. That's sad. That's sad. Because they feel like there's nothing left for them. Even though you telling them, hey, you can repent. Possibly. Who's to know if you'll be merciful and leave a blessing behind? Even a meat offering and a drink offering. Who's to say? But they feel like there's no need. There's no hope for me. Now, I'm not telling y'all none of that there to get yourselves out of pocket and feel like, well, shoot, there might be some hope. But you can't let that type of mind seep in to where the pleasure you got from the unrighteousness that has deceived you to commit it in the first place to where you be ensnared and trapped in it and stay in it. You find yourself getting out of pocket or you done got out of pocket, you better get your black behind in line. I mean, yesterday. And don't do it no more. Because if you go back to doing it truly, you were not remorseful, contrite, nor repentant. Because you went back and did it again. Because one time we can give you a mistake. Two times, maybe you're slipping. And that's stretching it to say maybe you're slipping. Three times, you've made a conscious choice. You have consciously chosen to rebel and to seek after your own heart and your own way. Can't make no excuse for that. You really did it on the second time, but we might can give you a pass. Because even Yah gave Saul a pass on two. He got him on strike three. Do you know what I'm saying? You got to think about that. Nevertheless, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, Allahim shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks all way to Allahim for you, brethren, beloved of Yahuwah, because Allahim from the beginning have chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Ruach and belief of the truth, whereunto he called you by our gospel to the, by, to the obtaining of the esteem of our master, Yahusha HaMashiach. You have to sit back and realize that if you were chosen to salvation through the sanctification of the Ruach and belief of the faith, belief of the word, belief of the end of righteousness, of the end of the Torah, which is the righteousness of Elohim, which is Yahusha HaMashiach, and you heard that by our preaching, that means you were chose to that. Because you got people who heard it and they, they stepped away from it. They were damned. They had pleasure and unrighteousness. You got to think, if you got pleasure in things that are not right, that man is going to damn you for it. And he's going to cause you to believe lies. And he's going to allow you to be deceived. And you're going to be deceiving other people. That's ugly. Now this man said he's going to stop the mouth of all liars. We already mentioned how he said he'll cut them off with the sword and feed them to the foxes. But let's look at Psalms 58 and 3. We'll start at verse 1 though. I'm going to get ready to taper it on down. We done hit a lot in a short period of time. Prayerfully everybody consider everything. I say praise be to Yah the name of Yahusha. I just hope everybody just weigh it out in their hearts and in their minds. And just think and pause and consider. On every matter. Because some things, you know, we, I mentioned a lot of word without actually going to read it. But 
I do want y'all to actually sit back and consider the operation of Elohim. Look how he operates. When you read the word, try to sit back and look at how you see things go down in your natural life so you can actually see, yeah, he really do operate like that. Because he really do bring people together for salvation and damnation. He really does that. He really sets people in the midst of other people who are uh, the epitome of his salvation, that they can be a testimony against those who love unrighteousness, that they might be damned. He really brings righteous men and women together and makes them husband and wives for his esteem to do whatever it is that he wants them to go do. He do bring men together to be friends and brothers who are of, of him, who are of the faith. He does this. Y'all don't make no mistakes. He don't do nothing by accident. Everything is orchestrated precisely and purposely for the manner of bringing esteem to his mighty and Kadesh and Baruch name. This is how this man moves. You got to understand how your father moves, how your master moves. Then you can be able to identify those that are his and those that are not. He said, those that are of the truth hear us. Those that hear us not are not of the truth. Therefore, we know the Ruach of truth and the Ruach of error. By their fruits, you shall know them. Everything after its kind. Strong with the strong, weak with the weak. He don't mix the two. We don't mix the serpent seed with the woman seed. He don't do that. He don't do that. You wonder why certain people you used to kick it with, or certain people you might have wanted to pursue, or certain people you were pursuing, and the next thing you know, they're gone. And you know, on the service level, you might be upset about it, this, that, that, and the third, but in your soul, you know what really happened. You know what really occurred. And if you got any common sense, you rejoice in your Elohim that he saved your life. And you know what the funny part is that I noticed? That the people who he saves his righteous from, the people who he saved them from, they, they got saved from the righteous party. When really, he, he was, shoot, you the one that needed to be, the, the person needed to be delivered from. You got to really think about that. People get shared from around you for a reason. Because they might be for your destruction. People get run crawl people in your life for a reason. In this pathway, if they in the word, for a reason. Nothing is by accident. Nothing is by mistake. Some things are by chance. Don't get it wrong. Because you know the book do say that. Some things are by chance. Most things are orchestrated. Psalm 58 and 1. Do you indeed speak righteousness, O congregation? Do you judge uprightly, O ye sons of men? Yea, in heart ye work wicked. Oh, man, this may said in your heart you work wickedness. Yea, weigh the violence of your hands in the earth. Come on around here, man. Galatians 5 and 17, you know. No, just run this stuff down. I want you to consider this. You know the stuff. But I'm going to tell you something, right? Because y'all should know, you know, Dabarine, Deuteronomy, that's just a rehearsal, the repeat of the law. Regardless, it's a lot of stuff in this book. And you can never, never, ever, for to a certain extent, manifest every single solitary thing that's out this book in one lifetime. It's for if it's one man's lifetime. Because most people only may be able to preach the word 20, 30 years maybe. But, uh, so you hear a lot of repeats. Uh, a reminder and a rehearsal for you to remember certain things. So when this man say, do you work wickedness in your heart? Before we read this here, 2 Corinthians chapter 13. I just want y'all to sit back and examine your own hearts. Are you working wickedness in your heart? And if so, stop. 2 Corinthians 13. I'm going to tell you something, right? At least it was, it, it was certain aspects of the day. It wasn't really that bad. But boy, it been hot as all outdoors the last couple of days. And you know, good old Florida summer is coming. And we talk about how hot it is. Just imagine if you somewhere where it's hot every day. And you can't escape it. And it's on your flesh. And you got maggots rubbing on you. All because you were deceived by unrighteousness and had pleasure in the things that are wrong. Why? 
Why is the question. Second, because what did man tell you? I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth. So turn yourselves for and live. Cast away from you all your iniquity, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. Because the long suffering of the master is that, that all may be able to come to repentance. That you might turn from your evil and wicked ways. Don't be like them niggas talking about ain't no hope for us. We shall walk in the evil imagination of our own heart. So when they were walking in the evil imagination of their own heart, they were working wickedness in their heart. Let's see. 13 and 5, 2 Corinthians. Examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Yahushua HaMashiach is in you, except ye be reprobates. Jeremiah 6 and 27. After Jeremiah 6 and 27, Galatians 5 and 17, Romans chapter 1. Examine your heart. Now he said, if you if Yahushua HaMashiach, if the word ain't in you, then you don't reprobate. I would hope that none of you are no reprobate. Reprobate means mean you're worthless. You're worthless. We could pull the Hebrew word up for it real fast. I'll probably get it fast on here and I will flip any pages. You want six and twenty-seven, Jeremiah six and twenty-seven. Yeah, you know, I just threw, threw that little, little piece out there for you. That word is ma'as and, and for reprobate and just saying it right now. And it's to reject or despise or to refuse, to loathe, to disdain, to despise a vile person. So uh, someone who is reprobate is someone who Yahuwah hates. Why would he hate you? Let's see why. Now this is about Hamashiach in verse 27. I done went over it in the past and we'll revisit it. He said, I have set thee for a tower and a fortress among my people that thou may know and try their way. He said, they're all grievous revolters. So when we look at the word revolter, it is sarar. And that is someone who is a rebel, someone who is stubborn, someone who is refractory, someone who is slides back or withdraws or falls away. We already read about the people who fell away. So Yah is going to hate anyone who falls away. You are despised in his eyesight. He said you are a grievous rebel. We know that you can't give that which is Kadesh unto dogs. You can't give that which is set apart unto rebels. And the word for grievous here is sir and it's to turn aside or to depart. Or to depart from the way or to avoid. So these are people who are avoiding the word and rebelling. This is what he said about it. He said they're brass and iron. They're all corruptors. And we look at corrupt. That's someone who perverts or destroys the word of Shekath or the ruin of beat rotted. And I'm going to tell you something, right? In the book of Jeremiah, I want to say about chapter 48, verse 10. He said, curse be he that doeth the work of Yah deceitfully. You round here corrupting and ruining, destroying, you're damned. You round here palm faking, you're damned. And you were damned from the womb, to be honest. He said, the bellows are burned, the lead is consumed of the fire, the founder melt in vain, for the wicked are not plucked away. Reprobate silver shall men call them, because Yahuwah have rejected them. See, people who rebel, y'all rejects them. He don't want nothing to do with you. Ain't no chast. Saul was a rebel. So there's no chastisement for you. You're a bastard. You don't belong to me. I don't know you, nigga. That man told you you're going to come to me and say, hey, he's going to say, I never knew you. You work of iniquity. But we prophesied in your name and didn't mean, nigga, I don't know you, cuz. That's why I be telling y'all that. Don't get caught up because somebody didn't say Yahuwah or Yahusha or can even sit back and, and manifest a script or two. That don't mean nothing. I keep the Sabbath, brother. You see my fringes? No pork on my fork. You wicked bastard, you. But you wicked on the inside because you work wickedness in your heart. There's violence in your heart. You hate your brother in your heart. Choose a murderer. And hate your brother in your heart ain't got nothing to do with, I, want, I don't like him. You hate your brother in your heart because you suffer sin upon him. You allow him to transgress. Won't say nothing. See him going the wrong way. Won't say nothing. 
Because you worry about upsetting a nigga. Worry about a nigga feeling. Screw if a nigga mad at you. They still love you tomorrow. Do you know what I'm saying? I'm just mentioning it because she's sitting right here. And I done told y'all this before. So, nigga, when little mother first say, yeah, I want to get married, I told her no. I don't care nothing about it. I changed her diapers. I fed her. Was with her when she learned how to ride a bike and taught her how to read and all that. That's, that meant nothing. No, nigga. This is not a wise decision. And she was upset. I could care nothing about it. When they were dwelling with one another, they weren't married. I told her, get you a Fisher Price set if you want to play house. I don't agree with this. Care nothing about that because that's little muffin. I'm going to let that slide. I know a lot of people feel like, oh, that's his sister. He won't say nothing to her. Clearly, you don't know me because she'll tell you different. I have no problem telling her, no, that's wrong. I don't agree with that. I'm not going along with that. I have no problem with that. Don't just give me fool because you hear him say, hey, muffin, and this, that, and the third. That I won't straighten little muffin if she needs to be straightened. The muffin just got a lot more sense. She's been dealing with me her whole life. She knows what I'm going to go along with and what I'm not going to go along with. She already knows this. I've known her her whole life. 26 years. I ain't got no problem with that. You know what I'm saying? I don't know why people think, oh, he's, he wouldn't tell us. Shh, bet you lied. I'm telling you, Muffin was upset for me by a good two, three days off that. No, I don't think you should do that. I don't I don't agree with that. I wouldn't do it. That's not a wise decision. I bet niggas, oh, yeah, go ahead and do it, you know. No, I didn't tell her that. Because it wasn't a wise decision at the time. It was very, very hastily. That's a major life decision. Getting married is a very, very major life decision. There's very, there's some major decisions you're gonna make in your life. Buying a house, shoot, buying a car, buying household appliances, having children, and that ties into getting married. You just don't get married haphazardly because you feeling lonely or want a companion or you got some itching in your loins. That is a major decision that you should take time on to make sure this is someone you ought to marry. LaMuffa gave the only scenario where I can find it acceptable of getting married quickly. That is someone that you were friends with for an extended period of time. You already knew them. Then you got together and then you got married not too long after that because you already knew this person. You know what I'm saying? But you talking about meeting somebody? And I'm talking about y'all just meeting each other. You talking about you want to get married six months later, a year later? That is not wise. You don't really know this person. What are you in a hurry for? I don't understand why people be so hurried to get married. I don't understand that. I don't understand why some people be so hurried to have children. If they're not married, you know, in the world anyway, wanting to have kids so bad. What are you in a hurry for? Are you even prepared to deal with that level of responsibility? I knew at a young age, man, I ain't finna have no kids, man. I'm not trying to have no kids. I'm not in a spot financially. Mentally, I felt like I could handle that very well. You know what I'm saying? But I'm like, financially, I'm not in a spot to take care of no kids, man. I'm not finna do that. Then you have to take into account the person you're having the children from. Because you can't, you can't, you're not asexually reproducing here. So there has to be a partner in that act. And you have to share parenting duties with this person. You know what I'm saying? Is this the type of person you want raising your children? And I ain't talking about just no women. Men too. Is this the type of man you want raising your child? What can he teach your child? You know what I'm saying? You have to think about that. You guess what a dude, what can he teach your child? What could he teach your son? What could he teach your daughter? About life. Not just a word. About life. What type of things can you impart to your children? What are you actually trying to learn for yourself so you can impart them to your children? Because you're the first teacher your child will ever have. And as a man, you're supposed to be solid to be able to teach your children something. Because that's not the woman's job just to teach your kids. Don't let the world fool you talking about the woman's supposed to be the nurturer and the first teacher. I don't know where they get that from. The man's supposed to be the one teaching them kids. That's your job to teach them children. Don't get this go around here for this new age stuff, this European stuff that women are teachers. Because if you go back in the annals of history, it was men doing all the teaching. And they taught the household. 
They didn't pass that off to the wife and say, you teach the kids, baby. I'm going to go out here and do this here. That man went out there and provided and came back home and taught the kids too. Does not the law say, I know him. He'll teach his household justice and judgment. Didn't say Sarah was going to teach his household this. Said Abraham was going to do it. So you think that's the only thing he taught him was the word of Yah and stop with that? You don't think he taught him nothing else? Yeah, the father's supposed to teach them children how to read. Teach them children how to count. That's your job to teach them that. Don't matter if you're tired because you've been working all day. Them your turn. You the one supposed to set that tone. That's not your wife's job to set that tone. We don't think like that though. We don't even have a desire to say, you don't even sit back and look at a child as the crafting and the creating. You can mold a mind. That's why I mentioned that with LeVar Ball. Nigga talking crazy. This man might be teaching his sons to be entrepreneurs and be independent and self-sufficient and create and own your own stuff. And he say, I've been doing this since they were born. So this is all they've been taught. And niggas think it's something wrong with this man because he's teaching his sons to be self-sufficient entrepreneurs and not to be exploited by your oppressor, but to take control of situations and you control it and you own it. That's what a man is supposed to do. That's what you're supposed to teach your sons and your daughters. You supposed to teach them. And if you a woman, if you see that man can't teach your children nothing, why would you want to be with a nigga that's dumb, that can't teach your kids nothing? That means he can't teach you nothing, which means y'all ain't going to do nothing. But be some nigga sitting in the house eating noodles looking at a TV. Because that's because in our society, well, at least with black people, we don't value intelligence over everything else of when you're picking a mate. We don't value two things, that they're a spiritual person and that they're intelligent. That means they have something to impart to the household. That means they're a leader, which means they can direct, which means they can guide, which means they can not only benefit themselves, but benefit other people. And that's what it's about. You're supposed to be able to try to benefit other people to make their lives better. If you see a woman, you want to be with that woman, you're supposed to have the intent that you're trying to change her life and make her life better. You bringing on friends or you trying to start a business and you bringing on workers, your objective is to make their lives better. Hamashiach came to make your life better. And you both to turn around and do the same. Nevertheless, where was that? Where are we going? I don't remember. Oh, I finished that. Galatians 5 and 17. That's why he said, does your heart work wickedness? Because one of the hallmarks of wickedness is selfishness. You got that in your heart, you need to get it out of there ASAP. Because you ain't going to be able to serve you who are carrying that along. Because that means pride going well up. And he give favor unto the humble, and he resists the proud. Because selfishness, selfishness is from the root of pride. Because you only care about yourself. You don't want to be like that. That's not an Allahim. What is it, 5 and 17? Galatians. And after that, Romans chapter 1, I got to wrap it down. It's about 11, 15. For the flesh lusts against the Ruach, and the Ruach against the flesh, and these are contrary one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led by the Ruach, you are not under the Torah. Now the works of the flesh are, the, are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, Hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, sedations, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revilings, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I've told you in time past, they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of Elohim. Hold on, we got to hit this Mark chapter 7 before I read this uh, Romans chapter 1. Remember, are you? he asked, are you working wickedness in your heart with the violence of the earth in your hands? Because the violence of the earth in your hands is killing Mashiach. Remember now, we've already went over this in the past. When you commit sin, you just is no different of saying, we want Barabbas. You ain't no different. You're working violence because you're doing violence to the Torah. Because you're treading underfoot the covenant of the son of Elohim. And treating the blood of the covenant which you were sanctified with as an unkadesh thing. 
You're trampling this man under your feet. He has no choice but to trample you. Mark chapter 7, verse 17, I want to say. I mean, y'all know what it is, but I just want to read that to itemize this because this is only for you to consider. That's all it's about, just for you to consider. Nothing more, nothing less. It's just for you to consider. 7 and uh, 18. And he saith unto them, Are you so without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatsoever thing from without enter into the man, it cannot defile him? Because it enter not into his heart, but into the belly, and go out into the drought, purging all meats. And he said, That which come out of the man, that defile the man. From within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile the man. You got to ask yourself, are you working these works of wickedness in your heart, in your lab, in your mind? Do they dwell there? And if so, you need to get them out of there. You need to purge your heart. You need to get that stuff out of there. That man ain't finna come and magically take your pride away, your foolishness away, your covetousness away. You have to resolute in your mind that I will no longer participate in this type of behavior or thoughts. Because the book said the thought of foolishness is sin. So therefore you must remove foolishness from your mind. Let's see how you were supposed to do it in Romans 1 and 28. Because I'm going to tell y'all this here, man, this is just real right. I can't tell nobody what they can and can't do. Because any one of you can do whatever it is that you set your heart to do. But if you don't set your heart to do it, you surely won't. That's guaranteed. You surely won't. If it's not in your heart to do it, you ain't going to do it. Just like the brother told me today. He said, yeah, boy, you right, boy. Going through old doors and come with no new ways. You're not finna get, that's why he told you. Can't put new wine in old bottles. Got to put new wine in new bottles. But they say, but straightway you don't desire the new because you say if the old is better. You like the way that you've been going. You like what you've been doing. And, but you don't want to turn back around even though you see it's detrimental. You say, I ain't got no hope. I'm just going to walk in the evil imagination of my heart. And for what? And for what? To die? For, a moment, for momentary pleasure? Even as they did not like to retain Elohim in their knowledge, Elohim gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy. I'm going to tell you that envy, devastating. Envy got envy made Cain do what he did. Envy made Esau want to kill Jacob. Envy made them deliver up Mashiach. Envy made Joseph's brothers sell him to the Gentiles and throw him in a pit. Envy is very, very dangerous. And truth be told, envy is not a trait of a, any real man. Ain't no real man got no business envying what another man got. That is weak. Men ain't got no business being jealous and envious of another man. Women either though. But especially men, it's more despicable than a man. I know it's not right for a woman either. But I ain't gonna lie. Stereotypically, you, you people expect women to be that way. I ain't saying it's right, but that's the stereotype, and that's how people look at it. But a man being envious of another man, that is despicable. Don't be envious about what other people got. Don't be trying to imitate, uh, imitate or emulate what other people got. Just sit back and wait for y'all to give you what's yours and, be, and do you. That's the whole problem with this whole world. As we look at stuff and we want to, you know, goals this and goals that. Just live your life, man. Stop trying to model your relationship after somebody. You don't even know them people. You don't know how these people's relationship is for real. People envying people's success. You don't know the work that person had to put in to get where they at. Nigga, you probably don't even want to do half the stuff that person had to do to get to that point. You don't want to put in that work. People envious of what people at knowledge in the word. How you envious about what y'all give to somebody else? Just hope that y'all he give you something. And if he don't, just pray he give you the ruach and your soul be saved. Stop being a chunk. Junk is disgusting. 
murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of Elohim, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. That that not that, that that lack of compassion, that uh, that without natural affection and that unmerciful, that's gotta be some big bad stuff too. You gotta ask yourself, that's wickedness in this to this man if you're not merciful. That's wickedness to this man if you're not compassionate. And to be able to be compassionate and to be able to put yourself in somebody else's shoes and see stuff from their perspective. Even if they're in the wrong. That's not saying you condoning they wrong. That's not saying you justifying they wrong. You can let them know that they wrong but still have compassion because the master knew that woman who was caught in adultery was wrong he still had compassion he just told her don't you go sin no more when he hear that dude say don't go go and sin no more lest a worse thing come upon you he didn't justify or condone their behavior he still had compassion though you got to know how to be able to do that just because somebody did something wrong does not mean I condone it. Does not mean that I justify it. But I got to be able to see their viewpoint and perspective. Not all the time, because sometimes niggas just being niggas. But I got to be able to understand their perspective so that I can be able to come up with a solution to be able to assist them. You have to be able to do that. That's another, And then also on top of that, who can have compassion to those who are out of the way? Just because somebody ain't walking in the world, we can't even learn to have compassion on them to be able to get them. Compassion does not mean condoning and justification. But the only way you can have compassion is you have to put yourself in somebody else's shoes. You have to see something from somebody else's perspective. Who knowing the judgment of Elohim that they which commit such things are worthy of death not only do the same but have pleasure in them that do them. We went through all that just for y'all to sit back to consider. Do you have wickedness in your heart? And if you do, remove it. Remove it. By the word. Purge your heart with the word. We need to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and ruach perfecting the fear of Elohim and true Kadesh. That's what we need to get to because we need to be moving on to perfection. Leaving all that other thing but becoming complete and coming whole. Because your king is soon to return. Come on back to Psalm 58. You see the handwriting on the wall? Psalm 58 and 2, right? Yea, in heart ye work wickedness. Ye weigh the violence of your hands in the earth. And that's another matter. Y'all willing, we come back to it. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. Now remember, there's enmity between the woman's seed and the serpent's seed. We pretty much then went over, right? He said he got to stop the mouth of lies. We know John 8 and 44 say, you have of your father the devil. He was a liar from the beginning. It just said right here, the deep people are born from the womb. The wicked are estranged from the womb, and they go astray telling lies. So let's look at estranged. Oh, you all right, New Muffin. That word estranged is Zor. And that's to become strange or an enemy. One who is alienated. So you think about that. He said the wicked are strange or an alienated from the womb. They are separated from Elohim from the womb. We know Isaiah 59 says it's sin that caused a man to be separated. Which goes right back to these people were damned from the time they were born. From the time they were born, they were separated and they belonged to the adversary. They were his. Job tells you that the children of the wicked are made for the sword. Which takes us to this Romans chapter 9. So let's look at that. Let's look at that. Romans chapter 9. You know, uh, verse 17, you know. For as the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, for even for the same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, that my name might be declared throughout all their rats. Therefore he have mercy on whom he will have mercy, and he on in whom he will harden. Thou wilt say unto me, Well doth, what why doth he yet find fault for who have resisted his will? 
Nay, but, O man, who art thou that reply against Elohim? Shall the thing formed to him say that formed it? Why hast thou made me thus? Have not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? What if Elohim willing to show his wrath and to make his power known and do it with much long suffering? The vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. Look at Proverbs 16 and 4, because I think I threw that up there too. He said, man, you got to sit back and look at that. Proverbs 16 and 4. That man said he made vessels of wrath fitted for destruction. He said, everybody whose names were not written in the Lamb's book of life will worship the beast. And look what Proverbs 16 says. And verse 4. You who have made all things for himself, yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. So he said he made them for this cause. And you're going to sit back and tell me niggas ain't born to go to hell. You're going to sit back and tell me. You can't tell me that you've been preordained to be saved and then you can't tell me somebody ain't been preordained to be damned. Come over here to Job 21 though. 21 and 26. Job going to sit back. Let me make sure this Job talk. This Job talking. Job talking to his friends right here. Look what Job say to his friends on this same matter before we get ready to wrap this on out. They shall lie down alike in the dust and the worms shall cover them. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm sorry. 22. This is verse 22. I'm sorry. Shall any teach Elohim knowledge seeing he judge those that are high? One died in his full strength being holy at ease and quiet. His breasts are full of milk and his bones are moistened with marrow. Another die in bitterness of his soul and never eat with pleasure. They shall lie down alike in the dust and the worm shall cover them. And if you don't know who that is, that's Lazarus and the rich man. That's the same thing you see in that parable and a couple other things. But let me keep it moving. I don't want to, because uh, my mind be moving when I see stuff. But I just have to mention it to y'all instead of keeping it to myself. He said, behold, I know your thoughts and devices which you wrongfully imagine against me. For ye say, where is the house of the prince? And where are the dwelling places of the wicked? Have you not asked them that go by the way? Do you not know their tokens? That the wicked is reserved to the day of destruction? They shall be brought forth to the day of wrath? Who shall declare his way to his face? Who shall repay him for what he have done? Yet, ye have be, yet shall he be brought to the grave and shall remain in the tomb. The clouds of the valley shall be sweet unto him. Every man shall draw after him as there are innumerable before him. How then comfort ye me in vain, seeing in your answers there remain falsehood. And there's a lot of things in that, but I'm going to stop before we uh, get off the beaten path there. But notice he just sat back and said, The wicked are reserved to the day of destruction, and they shall be brought forth to the day of wrath. He said the wicked are estranged from the day that they're born. And he said he has to stop the mouth of liars. Well, let's begin to look and see how he stopped the mouth of a liar in Revelation chapter 19. Because we know the beast was out there blaspheming. We know the serpent gave him his power and he's a liar. So this man out here telling lies. And let's see how he stopped the mouth of liars. The main liar and then all liars. Nineteen and twenty. Well, nineteen and nineteen. And I saw the beast and the kings of the rats and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was taken with him, the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, which he had deceived them that had received the mark of the beast. See, he deceived them. See, he told them lies. See, he was deceiving and being deceived because the beast was deceived and he deceived the people. So now he got to stop the mouth of this liar. Let's see how he stopped it. And then that worshipped his image. And clearly what he deceived them with is what he taught them. That's why he said, if another come bringing another gospel, when we have not preached, preaching unto you another Yahusha, because he's going to preach that he's Yahusha, he's going to preach another Mashiach, and you're supposed to know better. Those both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. This is how he stopped the mouth of that liar. Let's see how he stopped the mouth of the rest of the liars. 20 and 13. 20 and 12. And I saw the dead, Revelation, I'm sorry. 
Small and great stand before Elohim, and the books were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Whosoever was not found written in the book of the life was cast into the lake of fire and he gonna stop the mouth of lamb uh, of liars then because he say what ho hope is there of the hypocrite of the liar and that's when we go back to Jeremiah 18 and that's why the people turn around and said what they said and we didn't even get to what I wanted in Jeremiah 18 but praise the lamb because it worked out either way and everything that he wanted to be made known but I will read down to the verse that I wanted to read and I'll just, y'all willing, come back and deal with that in another day. And possibly we'll get to the Judges 5 that we touched on Wednesday on the morrow. And we'll be at Regency on the morrow in room B. Verse 11. Now therefore go to and speak to the men of Yehuda and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith Yehuda, Behold, I frame evil against you and devise a device against you. Return ye now, every one, from his evil way and make your ways and your doings good. They said, There's no hope, but we will walk after our own devices, and we will every one do the imagination of his evil heart. Therefore, thus saith Yehuda, Ask ye now among the heathen who have heard such a thing. The virgin of Yasharal have done a very horrible thing. I bet say, Ask among the heathen if they ever heard something like that. Will a man leave the snow of Lebanon which come from the rock of the field or shall the cold flowing waters that come from another place be forsaken? Because my people have forgotten me. They have burned incense to vanity. They've caused them to stumble in their ways from the ancient paths and to walk in paths in a way not cast up. To make their land desolate, a perpetual hissing, every one that passed thereby shall be astonished and wag his head. I will scatter them as with the east wind before the enemy, and I will show them the back and not the face in the day of their calamity. That man said, I'm going to turn my back on you because you reject it. That's what that means about he telling you about being reprobate. When you rebel against him and say, I'm going to walk in my own heart and my own way, that man said, I'm going to destroy you and I'm going to turn my back on you. I will not turn my face to you. There will be no salvation or deliverance for you. And only those who've been estranged from the womb would dare open their mouth and say that. Then said they come let us devise devices against Jeremiah. For the Torah shall not perish from the priest. Nor counsel from the wise. And we will deal with this verse 18 soon. Y'all will it. Nor the word from the prophet. Come. Let us smite him with the tongue. Let us not give heed to any of his words. Give heed to me, O Yahuwah, and hearken to the voice of them that contend with me. Shall evil be recompensed for good? For they did the pit for my soul. Remember that I stood before thee to speak good for them and to turn away thy wrath from them. That man sat back and said, these people want to kill me and do all these things and I was here for their good. But look what Jeremiah said. Therefore deliver up their children to the famine and pour out their blood by the force of the sword. Let the wives be bereaved of their children and be widows. Let their men be put to death. Let their young men be slain by the sword in battle. Let a cry be heard from their houses, which when thou shalt bring a troop suddenly upon them, for they have did the pit to take me and hide stairs from my feet. Yet Yahuwah, thou know all their counsel against me to slay me. Forgive not their iniquity, neither blot out their sin from thy sight, but let them be overthrown before thee. Deal thus with them in the time of thy anger. I guarantee you somebody will say, Jeremiah, I ain't no man of y'all. What man of y'all will say, let the children be killed and be widows? Who would say that? Jeremiah said, I was son out here to do them good and to speak your words to them, and they want to kill me. He said, I hope you kill all them niggas and don't forget none of their sin. Now look how hard and harsh that was. Nigga, like, he can't be no man. A man of y'all wouldn't say nothing like that. He would have pled for the mercy of the people for y'all to save them. Instead, Jeremiah say, man, kill them. Don't even blot they sent out. Only because they seek to kill me. Because I told them what you told me to say. That's why I can tell. Uh, 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 niggas ain't reading. 
But nevertheless, hallelujah for Yahusha and the word, man. You know, uh, Yah is good. The word is good. It's faithful and on time, every single time. Uh, but it's always harsh things that ha have to be spoken. Harsh things that people don't want to hear. To the to the viewer on there, uh, we love you, bless y'all, the house of y'all, name of Yahusha, I'm a Shiak, but I'm finna stop this thing so it doesn't have a missing link. Well, I'm gonna stop the record.